from KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk, I'm Laurel Porter. We bring you this episode from the state capitol in Salem, where the 82nd annual legislative session gets underway next week with an ambitious agenda. And it's already been a busy week here in Salem. Tina Kotek was sworn in as the state's 39th governor. And before she was governor, she was Speaker of the House. And succeeding her in that role is Democrat Dan Rayfield, who was formally re-elected to his second term this week as well. In this episode of Straight Talk, we sit down with Dan Rayfield and we ask him about what he hopes to accomplish in this legislative session and how he plans to build bridges with Republicans. Here's our conversation. Thank you for joining us here on Straight Talk, Speaker Rayfield. Thank you for hosting us here in your office here in Salem. Yeah, thank you so much for coming down. Well, let's start off with the significance. What do you think the significance of the 2023 session is? How important is it? Oregon's facing some unique, what I would say are unprecedented opportunities. Um, unprecedented opportunities to seize on the semiconductor industry, unprecedented opportunities in terms of housing and homelessness, and also our behavioral health crises that we're experiencing across the country, and specifically here in Oregon. So we have this opportunity to come in and make progress on those, at the same time making sure Oregon is delivering on some of its essential promises. So promises like public defense, making sure that our kids are the education that we expect and so that's where when we come into this new session there's this a ton of excitement if you weren't here in the Capitol yesterday you could really feel it among a lot of the legislators so just a small agenda just a small <laughs> one this year a lot of priorities and we'll dig down into some of those but I know you have a lot of priorities but at the foundation what are your core values that support the foundation of your role as speaker and as what you want to achieve this session I think if you think about a principle that you're trying to operate within, uh, and I kind of mentioned more policy principles, seizing opportunities, making sure the government is delivering, but then there's also what I would say are like leadership principles as you bring a legislature through a session like this. One of these is building a culture of respect. Uh, I grew up in a family, and I think we talked about this the last time I met. I had a father who was a Republican, a mother who was a Democrat. They wanted the same things, and it was easy for me to assume good intent in their actions because they're my parents, right? You love them. Uh, as I come into this building, I think it's easier, right, to really see that in each of us. And then how do you foster that environment where we look at each other from two different parties, but knowing that whether you're Democrat or Republican, you all want good schools. Um, and I think that is these, and, and it's not just schools, right? It is, you want to make sure everybody has health care. You want to make sure everybody has behavioral health care. Uh, I think if we start from that base, um, we can really start to move forward and make progress on some of these issues. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to have challenging conversations, because we are. We should expect them and embrace them. Uh, but that's the beautiful thing about a democracy. Well, one of the ways I think you're trying to build respect is you traveled across the state for three days. You went to Eastern Oregon and Central Oregon. What was your big takeaway from that trip? And what are your thoughts about trying to bridge the urban-rural divide? Well, first off, one of the best things about being a legislator, if you ever get the chance, um, is you get to just learn and travel and meet people. And you really start to appreciate that my life, where I live in Corvallis, is vastly different um, than whether you're in Portland, whether you're in Eastern Oregon. Uh, so part of the, the value for me in move, going to a different community, going to a different area of the state, is really just to learn and listen and see what do people need in these different areas uh, as they try and fulfill what their vision for Oregon is, right? And that's different for every region of the state. It's also where we get to build relationships with other legislators along the way. Uh, we spent a lot of time learning about how important water is um, to the agricultural industry, not just for a, what I would say is an economic purpose, but also for ecology, right, in terms of the environment. I mean, there's these beautiful pairings uh, between something that's critically important for the rural economic um, I guess aspirations that they have for themselves and in the democratic side where we're really excited about the environment, right? And so it's how do you find that pairing? And you spent time with the minority leader, Vicki Breeze Iverson, in her hometown of Prineville. How would you describe your working relationship with the minority leader? And, and Republicans want to know what your plan is to try to work across the aisle to have the best outcomes possible for all Oregonians. First, Leader Breeze Iverson it was the most amazing host in the world. Uh, so she, she got us over to Prineville. We spent a lot of time looking at the data centers. We went spoke with local elected officials. Uh, and then she hosted us in her house for a wonderful dinner. Um, 
um, on her ranch, and it was a, a tremendous amount of fun. And I can say that there were a lot of non-political conversations. Uh, but really, for me, it's about building that relationship. And again, where I said that we're seeing the good intent in each other. Um, well, we have a foundation of trust uh, where something may not go either of our way, but when we can look and work with each other and just call us up and say, let's talk about that and what does that mean? And I don't think that happens overnight. And I think there is, just like in our personal relationships, there's an investment in the personal relationship. Um, I think we have to do that within this building as well. And, and Leader Breeze Ivers and I are just beginning to do that. We've been doing it for a year, um, but we're gonna keep doing it this whole session. And I'm pretty sure she'll get grumpy with me at some point, uh, and I with her, but we'll, I mean, we'll always be able to come back um, and try and find common ground. I've heard you say that um, your priorities kind of fit in three categories, one of which is making sure things work, things are working. And a lot of Oregonians look at what's happening in D.C. and say, well, the federal government may not be working the way they'd like it to. How can you make sure Oregonians can trust that Oregon government is working the way it should when it comes to education, behavioral health, homelessness, addressing homelessness, and affordable housing? So this gets back to when I said unprecedented opportunities. It, this was a unique election cycle. And in, in my role, I'll spend a ton of time out of curiosity, but also out of necessity, looking at a lot of the campaign mailers. You saw Democrats, Republicans talking about the same things. Every campaign was talking about housing. Every campaign was talking about behavioral health. That's an opportunity of commonality. Um, and that is where we can come into the session and let's focus on some of these things that we agree on. And those are the things that Oregonians expect us to be delivering on that right now just are not working. Um, and that's where I can get excited to say, okay, this isn't gonna be that partisan rub um, that we've had in the past. Of course, we're gonna have different philosophies about doing things. And sometimes the different philosophies happen within one specific party. Um, but again, that long-term outcome, no one believes that we should have the, the homelessness crisis that we have right now. Everyone believes we have to increase the supply of housing. We need to build more houses. We're underbuilt by more than 100,000 homes in the state of Oregon. So that's the commonality and I think hopefully, my hope is, right, that by building the relationships, working together, having that same vision, um, we can make meaningful change this session. And the governor's going to declare a state of emergency when it comes to homelessness. How do you see lawmakers working to help tackle that issue? So I was very excited. I met with the governor last week and she talked uh, a little bit about some of those executive orders. Um, I think it is a perfect partnering with where the legislature is going to go. Now some of the actions that she's going to take are gonna require some legislative partnership in terms of funding. Within the state of Oregon, I believe that the Oregon legislature needs to build an investment package within the first 60 days. Oregonians, again, when we get back to campaigns or whether you just are talking to your neighbor in your community, they want action now. Um, and we have to start delivering on that. So I think there's gonna be this nice partnering of immediate action through the governor's office, as well as us being, as a legislature, being able to deliver on, there's the prevention side, we need to prevent people from becoming houseless. Then there's the immediate supports of getting people people into homes, and then there's the long-term vision, right, which is the supply, we need to build more. Um, those are the things that we'll be able to tackle this session. Uh, the second category that, that you mentioned is um, investing in Oregonians. What does that look like this session? For me, investing in Oregonians looks like the semiconductor industry. We have this unique opportunity with the Federal CHIPS Act where we can draw down hundreds of millions of dollars to spur growth within our own state. These are the type, this is the type of growth that will create family wage jobs for I mean, decades. It's also the type of jobs that can lift up Oregonians from generations of poverty. That's the excitement of this opportunity where we are able to take action as a state to show the federal government that we are bought in and invested in this type of uh, growth in our state. And that's exciting. Uh, and so that is something that for me, we set up a joint committee. We were able to get the Senate president to agree to put a joint committee on semiconductors. The purpose of the joint committee of senators and representatives meeting early is that we can take action quicker because their application deadlines or I shouldn't say deadlines when they'll start taking applications is going to be in February. You know there's no greater investment I think in Oregonians than it is in education. You have an 11 year old son, a lot of kids are behind because of the pandemic and remote learning. Do you have a plan as far as education that takes up a big chunk of the budget um, this year to address some of those issues? One of the biggest issues that we're seeing and we hear a lot about is workforce. 
um, during the pandemic. Um, this was not easy whether you were a student, it wasn't easy whether you were a teacher, and it wasn't easy whether you were a parent. Um, but what we're seeing from the workforce was there were a lot of people who left the workforce. Um, we tried to make investments during the short session. I think we put $100 million into recruitment and retention. We also looked at streamlining the processes for um, bringing in teachers from out of state to be able to make sure they have the same standards as they come in for certification. Uh, we need to go back and look at the current workforce crisis and find ways again to continue the recruitment and the retention. I am uh, want to go back and see how the last $100 million of uh, investment, how well that worked. What do we need to do better? Um, for me, when we are able to get teachers in the classroom, that reduces classroom sizes, which then equates to outcome for our kids. There's also some really good literacy programs that are being discussed right now, again, for like third grade literacy, directly tied to outcomes. So I think there's you have structural issues, and then we really need to focus on outcomes. I want to drill down just a little bit more on education. This question comes from House Republicans, and they say despite Oregon's record allocation of the state school fund of $9.3 billion, the last biennium, Oregon student achievement rates rank fifth from the bottom in the nation. They ask, is spending more money going to make a difference, or are structural changes that you kind of mentioned there needed to Oregon's education system? So it's a combination of both. Right? I mean, we're seeing inflation across the board. To say that we're not going to increase spending when we're having um, inflation within different school district budgets wouldn't be necessarily honest. Um, we also have to have a budget that allows school districts to hire and retain teachers. Um, if we're not hiring or retraining teachers, then we're having lower in classroom sizes and we're not getting the outcomes that we need to know because we know that classroom size is directly tied to outcomes. Literacy, um, there's unique programs that we can spend that will actually increase the training for teachers as well as provide resources for third graders. This improves equity outcomes um, as well as uh, long-term outcomes in our entire uh, school system. So those are things that I think where you can actually make traction on. Um, but I would agree with the fact that you just can't throw money at every problem either. Um, there has to be outcomes tied to this. We can also, as a government, and we should, go back to some of the historic investments we made in 2019. We're talking $2 billion of investments into K through 12. We need to make sure that we're getting what, what we're paying for, which is part of that, um, what I would say is those themes of making sure the government's delivering on their promises. And this kind of ties into the theme of delivering on promises and investing in Oregonians, behavioral health, behavioral yes. health care. And the Oregon legislature passed a package of bills the last two sessions, I think, for over a billion dollars. We also have Measure 110, the money from that coming online. Is all of that money getting to where it needs to go to the communities, and is it making a difference? So there's a couple things. When I think about behavioral health, right? Think, I think about a spectrum. Um, on the one side, I think about it in, in your private pay and our personal world. So I'm a parent, I wanna make sure that my son or my daughter can have access to behavioral health care. There's a workforce crisis. Um, we did some stuff on rates um, in that package you mentioned. It's starting to trickle in. Now, as a parent, you don't necessarily see the workforce slowly improving, but it is. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, in terms of crisis response, uh, it, we've been increasing residential treatment facility beds. We've been doing crisis respite centers. So when someone's in that immediate crisis, they're able to get connected with services. Now that's something where you get eight beds one month. You get 12 beds the next month. Those are really big victories for those human beings experiencing in those, what I would say, critical periods in their lives. We have to do more of that. One of the big things that we can do this session, again, uh, getting back to making sure that billion dollars that we're putting into behavioral health is getting the outcomes that we're looking for, um, and we need to re-examine that. The other thing is 988. This is a crisis hotline that we need to invest in, which then also invests in direct crisis services in every county in this state. Again, connecting at that beginning part of that spectrum where people need services now and connecting them as they move through uh, that continuum. A third category that you talk about yeah. is strengthening democracy. What, does, what do you envision uh, for that working on this session? So democracy for me and kind of structural reforms uh, are one of the most long-lasting impacts that anyone in government can have. Uh, when you're able to strengthen democracy, that impacts all the decisions moving forward. Uh, so if you think about campaign finance reform, 
right? When you're able to get money out of politics, uh, I can be excited about my behavioral health bill. That's one bill. But when I'm able to change this foundational part of the system, it has ripple impacts on every bill that is passed moving past, moving beyond that point. So campaign finance reform is a wonderful way where we can start moving in that direction. Um, we can strengthen our ethics laws um, here in Oregon. There's transparency with money. Um, in politics. Uh, on top of that, we can really look at electoral reforms, right, where we can ensure that a majority is always required to elect our officials. So I'm a big proponent of ranked choice voting, where we rank candidates in order of preference. Do you think that'll come up in, in the legislature when you vote on something like that? You know, if, if I have my way, um, of course, we have 90 members that we have to have this discussion with. Um, but I would say I'm a, I'm a chief sponsor on a bill that would implement ranked choice voting for our statewide offices here in Oregon. Um, I really do believe that uh, ranked choice voting gets rid of that component where people strategically vote. Um, for their candidates and maybe they really want to vote for that third party candidate, but they they don't believe that third party candidate is viable um, You should be able to vote for who you want right um, in politics um, You know sometimes third party candidates are viewed as um, You know n not viable right um, we should have a system that supports anybody who wants to run for office They should have the ability to run for office um, and everybody should be able to vote for who they want Let's revisit what you said about campaign finance reform, because this is something you and I talked about after the last session, something you're passionate about, you've been passionate about for a long time, I understand, since you were 19 years old. It's something that you, you worked on. Last session, legislators weren't able to come up with any limits. It's something that Oregonians really want. They overwhelmingly passed campaign finance reform in 2020. Do you think you'll be successful this time? Or are you optimistic? And if you're not, do you have any uh, backup plans? So so as you noted, I've been working on this for a really long time, um, since I was 19, and, and the context was I stood outside of grocery stores trying to gather signatures to put it on a ballot measure. Uh, and so I've been doing this a long time. I'm used to disappointment, I will say that. I have been nothing but excited um, with the voters in Oregon who have approved and said, hey, we want this. Uh, and I think it's up to the legislature to find a way to do it. Now the tough thing about being in a legislator, leg legislature is you have 90 different people with 90 90 different opinions on what that should look like. You have some that don't want any limits, some that want really low limits, uh, and we have to find that sweet spot. Uh, and it, campaign finance reform has been that windmill that I just will always tilt at uh, no matter what happens. Uh, and so I anticipate that to be a f uh, what I believe to be an exciting and fun conversation in the session because ultimately campaign finance reform gets money out of politics. And, and I think the thing we don't often talk about is it opens doors for new um, folks to run for office. Office, people that have been historically disenfranchised from this building. Um, and that is extremely important because money is a barrier um, for folks being in this building. And well, we all look, voices should be here. We look forward to following that. I know that you are a budget guy and we're going to talk <laughs> about the budget, which may sound kind of dry, but it's very important. We'll talk about that right after the break. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. We're bringing you the show this week from Salem, from the state capitol, and we're in Speaker of the House Dan Rayfield's office. Thanks again for being our guest here on Straight Talk this week. Absolutely. Well, I mentioned in the last segment that you are a budget guy. You were the head of the budget committee, is that right? For uh, three and a half years, yes. So this is so important. All the things we just talked about, you know, the foundation is the budget, and the revenue forecast comes out in May. May not be as flush as we've seen the last couple of years. We had a lot of money coming in from the federal government because of the pandemic and the coronavirus packages. That's drying up now. What is the outlook for the budget? And we hear talk about the possibility of a recession. How concerned are you? Really good questions, and I think as you pointed out, I find the budget personally exciting, um, and not everyone does. Uh, is we, if you're outside of the world and you don't think about budgets, the one thing to take away from the conversation is Oregon is one of the most prepared states out of all 50 states to weather a recession. Uh, we've been historically putting away money into our rainy day fund uh, for a really long period of time, and there's independent analysis that says that we're just prepared um, because we've taken those proactive measures. So that's what we have going for us as we walk into the session. You're absolutely right that over the past two years during the pandemic, there was an influx of federal money that has come into the state. Um, we're not going to have that money this cycle. And so that 
will challenge us when we talk about housing. Um, we have to think more diligently how we're going to find that funding package. When we think about behavioral health, you have to prioritize in a different way um, than you did when you had uh, these amounts of money coming from the federal government. Now we've done it before and we've done it responsibly. The crises that we're facing right now are to the, the extent where we will figure out ways to do these things. Um, it's just not as readily apparent when you first walk into a session about how you're going to get from point A to point B. Uh, when we meant to think about recessions, and I think that's on a lot of people's minds, again, we're set up really well to weather them. Um, and in any circumstance where you have all this federal money that's coming in and it starts to dry up, you can have that potential for a slowdown. The beautiful part about where we're at is we know this. We're starting to see these things, and so the actions we can take in this session can actually begin to mitigate, or hopefully mitigate, some of those slowdown impacts. So we talk about semiconductors, and again, I, people say, why do you keep calling it an unprecedented opportunity? Well, it's because we can invest in that, draw down more federal dollars as a way to potentially mitigate anything that could happen down the road. And so that, that's the excitement, that, and I think the potential we have this session. Um, and it's just, we're just very fortunate to be in a state like Oregon. Well, I know you've been really proud about how much money you could put into Reserves. Do you think you're going to have to dip into those reserves very much? And do you think you'll be able to add more to the reserves? What does that look like? It's early to tell. Uh, we'll have several forecasts that will come on throughout the session. We'll have one that will happen at the end of February, and, and you mentioned the one at the end of May, which is really what we use to close out the budget. Uh, they have been projecting a mild slowdown, um, and so if they continue to project that, um, the need for dipping into reserves obviously is less. If the slowdown were to be much bigger, unexpectedly, um, then we might reallocate uh, or think about how we think look at reserves. One of the other things that we can, you know, and you have to find the, the lemonade in, in the pile of lemons, right? It's been really challenging workforce-wise. Um, and so a lot of our state agencies have not been able to hire up to the level that they need to provide the services in their communities. And so when state agencies are unable to spend money, that reverts back to the state. Um, and so there's these little hidden pots of what I would say opportunities as we, you know, try and balance the budget and craft packages for housing, behavioral health, um, and other critical areas. House Republicans want to know if House Democrats are going to propose any new taxes. So it, it, I don't see us, and, and when they say taxes, I think they're thinking about these brand new packages like we, you know, that have happened in the historically in the past. Um, there are small proposals that you have, you know, where there's inflationary increases in fees in a given um, agency or things like that. I don't see any significant proposals moving forward this session. We have a couple of minutes left, but I did want to touch on gun safety because I know Measure 114 uh, passed narrowly in the last election is now being held up in the courts. That includes some gun safety measures. But I understand that House Democrats may propose some additional measures that aren't included under Measure 114. What are we looking at as far as possible legislation that could come up around guns? And this is a really um, interesting place, right, where I think we try and find unity in where we're moving forward, but there's always difficult conversations, and gun violence prevention um, is always a challenging conversation in this building. Uh, and we put together a group of legislators to really hone in and find some proposals that will actually get outcomes when it comes to gun violence prevention. One of those is what you'll hear, and the Attorney General is really working hard on this, is ghost guns. Um, these are those types of untraceable guns um, that we've seen be used in crimes across the state and cr frankly across the nation. Um, we want to crack down on those types of guns. Uh, we have a, a measure that will actually expand safe spaces in Oregon where um, you can't bring guns into those spaces. On top of that, we have another measure that will increase the age of purchase for certain types of firearms. Now, we don't want to get involved in, uh, and mix with a family that you know has a history of hunting with their, their families, but there's certain types of um, guns that are being purchased between that 18 to 21 range that are continually being used in some of the most tragic events across the, the country. And so those are the host of things that we're looking at this session. Again, really focus on tying them to outcomes. Speaker Rayfield, we have about 30 seconds left, but I want to give you time for a final thought to share with our viewers about what they can expect from this session. You know, I would probably take the time to just remember that your state legislator is someone that is extremely accessible. Um, it's one of the last positions in government that you can call them up and probably get to go out to coffee with them. Speaker Rayfield, thank you for joining us here on Straight Talk. Thanks for having us.
And that's our show from the state capitol in Salem. Thanks for watching. We thank Speaker Rayfield. We had a lot more we wanted to ask the speaker, and he agreed to a bonus episode of Straight Talk. And you can find that on our KGW Straight Talk podcast and on the KGW YouTube channel. Join us next week when we talk about a critical issue we brought up in this episode, behavioral health and the staffing shortage. We'll see you next week for Straight Talk. Have a great week.